Welcome to the next in our series of short video interviews where I ask what's next post COVID-19. And I'm talking today to two for the price of one senior HR leaders where uh, joining me today is Justin Dinter from the, who's the Chief People Officer at Breaking Way and Berta Mester, who's the MD Global Head of Performance, Engagement and Culture at Deutsche Bank. So good morning, both of you, and thank you for joining me. Hi. Hi, thank you. And um, where are you both based today, if I may ask as well? Where are you joining us from? I'm in um, sunny Hertfordshire. I'm Berta. And I'm in Wiltshire. There you go. Right, thank you for joining us. So today, um, we've obviously been doing these COVID interviews. This one's a little bit different because we're trying to involve it a little bit. And um, and it's great that you could both join us. So if I get you both uh, initially to sort of introduce yourselves and let us know a little bit more about you and that the interaction with the two organizations and how they fit. So if I could start um, with you first, Justine. So if you could let us know a bit more. Okay, yes, yeah, so I, um, I work for um, a small startup that is called Breaking Wave that um, is part of the Deutsche Bank group. Um, so we are a software engineering capability. Um, so we're a separate um, company, uh, a separate entity, to, uh, but within the Deutsche Bank group. Um, and so we're essentially like a fintech um, owned by the bank. Okay, great, thank you. And Berta, so give us a little overview of your good self as well. Yes, like you said already, I'm the global head for performance, engagement, culture. So everything we do will apply to 90,000 people in 60 countries. And what we want to achieve is that people can be their true self. And we don't mean that in a cliched way, but really that people feel motivated and they can be as productive as they can be in terms of the frameworks we give them, the tools, the coaching and the learning, and all focused on, of course, um, being able to do the contribution for the bank and what we need to achieve as Deutsche Bank. Great, lovely. And Justin, just how long has Breaking Wave been um, formed? How, how long ago is that? Yeah, so we're just over um, a year now um, and we're very small. So we have um, two kind of operating models and one is an employed model, which is a very small sort of number of um, people employed by Breaking Wave. And then we also have a community model where um, whether that's colleagues from Deutsche Bank or vendor partners, consultants or, or Breaking Wave software engineers can sort of really work in uh, the same sandbox if you like working on uh, technology projects together um, so it, it's quite a sort of innovative um, environment where where people can work on these projects together and, and try on new things it's a space for trialing new projects doing things differently whether that's sort of technology culture um, a really sort of like space to sort of uh, try stuff um, work out if it works you know kill it expand it um, but learn lots in the process Okay, terrific. Okay, that sounds very exciting. So, okay, so let's try and so these change these, these questions are slightly different to normal, but let's kind of look at because obviously we've gone through the pain and, and, and almost some of some of the kind of harder stuff with COVID and now we're coming hopefully back out the other side. So let's ask this first one, which is um, so reflecting, I guess, back on the last six months of, of the crisis, uh, I guess, what are your key insights and takeaways, uh, you know, from from this for, for you and your organization? So, um, Justine, can I start with you? Yeah. So, I think when I when I look at the the whole sort of six months, um, sort of going back to March, um, I think there's a key thing here for me, which is about communication, um, and there's something around the simplicity of those messages. Um, so, at, at Breaking Wave, we we moved to the sort of remote working um, a couple of weeks before. Um, the sort of the government sort of full lockdown. Um, and obviously we did that um, very deliberately. You know, we had lots of other countries where we can sort of look at and, and see the trends and, and the way that things were going. Um, but there was something about uh, when, when the UK went into the lockdown and those very sort of simple messages, you know, stay at home, save lives, protect the NHS, that was very, very clear 
Um, and, you know, with those simple messages, you could very quickly sort of get understanding and, and be very clear to people and, and sustainably change behaviour. Um, and my reflection on that is, you know, as the six months progressed and some of those communication messages perhaps get a little bit more nuanced, um, that's when, you know, it can become a little bit more difficult and, and potentially um, confusing to people. So, you know, what was important for us at Breaking Wave was making decisions that were in line with our values um, so that, you know, there's, there's a sort of a relevance there and, you know, the messages and the ways of working were very sort of um, seamless to people, that they were in line with our values um, and people could see that that was very, um, you know, clearly understood. Um, but, you know, we just had to not be vague and, and you know, there for people, available, um, and, and it's the old cliche, isn't it, really? Communication, communication, communication. Yeah. But, you know, it really did sort of seem to be very important. And I think I think also, as you say, yeah, after a long period of time, people get tired and, you know, and that patient, patience has gone a little bit, isn't it? So, yeah, keeping in communication has been tough. And, um, yeah, OK, Berta, what, what, are you, what, what have you been seeing, really? What, yeah, definitely building on um, Justine's theme and I think our managers that has been a really good insight and in learning that they can manage differently um, if they are pushed to it actually and it's really about transparency and honesty and trusting people that they will do the job and um, that has made such a difference and it's not anything new but i think some of our managers understood that you can't leave anything implicit you need to be explicit if you are in a virtual environment and with that what we've seen at deutsche bank is that people understood much clearer what was expected of them and the second point uh, which made me slightly chuckle because obviously i have been in performance and organizational development for many, many, many years. And we all know what counts is managing by outcome, not by presence. But I think this crisis has shown that to be so true because most of the jobs can be done anywhere, anytime. And there is absolutely no need to drive productivity from a certain space, unless of course it's um regulated or there are certain tools which can't be had in a different environment and the third one is more employee reflection because it's the first time certainly in our industry and i would say in the knowledge management industry in general that people's rut has been broken and all of a sudden they look above the parapet and they go wow you know if i take out the commute I have so much more time available, you know, for friends, for family, for my hobbies. And I think there has been a real sort of breathing um, space um, for quite a lot of our colleagues. Now, that's not to say that um, the time has been perfectly terrible for um, many people from an economic point of view, you know, whether the personal situation they were in. But the majority of feedback which I hear and, and get is that this was quite a welcome, different perspective of how work can be done. Yeah, I mean, we've got to remember this is this was forced upon us uh, and companies had to then react. So people didn't have a choice, did they? So I think that's been the interesting thing from a behavior change sort of point of view and how people then have, have kind of been able to react and and, and kind of progress through this really. So no, I think there's some, some really good points there. Okay. Um, and is there anything, um, I guess, I guess is there anything more uh, you, you feel from this in terms of, obviously wellbeing came into play quite heavily because you know we, we've had to kind of look after the wellbeing of our employees and people around us. Um, and, and, and also this whole thing where you're in, you're in banking. So risk, you know, risk I think has been a huge, issue for people to get their heads around because everyone's uh, personal feeling of risk is very different to, to, to the next person's. Yes, 
I think that's right. But um, I think on it's interesting when you say risk, and I'll just take a particular angle because obviously we've had lots of conversations around it about will people do the right thing when they're not in the environment. But to be honest, banking hasn't covered itself with glory when we were all in the workplace. And I think in the end, it is about setting very clear expectations of what you need people to do. You need to do the role modeling. You need to keep the connection with people and talk to them and make it very clear um, what is um, expected and tolerated and what is not and then have consequences follow and that will really change it and of course it's been forced upon us um but and and lots of things wouldn't have happened for many years if we if we haven't had the crisis yeah justine anything to add really on, on that side no i think um i i think the point around time and trust and commute is an interesting one because in some instances um you know i think we've seen businesses or people almost go into overdrive um and you know certainly lots of um people in the network talk about you know i'm working you know 12 14 hour days so not only the commute or not, you know, using that commute time for, you know, whether it's sort of like physical exercise, meditations, you know, something around your well-being. I think there's a danger that, um, you know, I've heard stories of people going, you know, having 12 hours of back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, which I think there's also um, a danger there as well, and for, for businesses and individuals to look after their own well-being. There's a piece about bringing what this is shown is the whole self to work kind of part because people are getting the family in the backgrounds and you know in some of these virtual meetings that we have. So I think yeah I totally agree. There's a piece of that and and the, yeah your danger is this sort of um, uh, this this sort of uh, I guess the pressures on them are so great, aren't they? They feel they need to be present and, and accountable for which we're trying to get away from, aren't we? We're trying to move away from that. So okay okay. Um, OK, let's move on to, to the second question, then, if I may. So I guess this is kind of looking at where we're going in terms of this better, the new better, you know, a better way. Um, so from the four changes to date, what do you believe employees at any level will expect to want or to keep from, from those changes that we've seen to date? So, um, Berta, can I start with you? Yeah. So I think it's the flexibility. Um, which people want to keep. I think that is a very big one because once, like we just discussed, you know, the homeschooling falls away and the kids are back in school and you have the old system set up again, I think there is this time aspect. And what the, the COVID crisis has shown is that you don't need to have the nine to five, Monday to Friday set up to be productive, you know, it can be flexible. And it's not that people are saying we don't ever want to come back into the office, but what they are saying is I don't need to be watched to do my work. When I come back into the office, I want to do that because of collaboration or networking or socialization because I do actually like people around. But when there is time, um, to retreat, I want to be able to retreat and I want to be able to do certain things in my life, be it watching the kids um, play or doing some coaching or having a hobby and then saying, I'll come back to it. As long as the job gets done, isn't that what it's all about? And I think we will see that mindset evolving much more. Justine, do you agree? Definitely. It's, it's, uh, it's the same answer. It's definitely around the flexibility. And I think one of the things that we're um, thinking about is, uh, to, to Berta's point, um, how do we have a working pattern which is potentially in the office one week out of the month? And what's the purpose of that week in the office? So what are the deliberate um, activities that we use that week for that build our cultural capital? So at the rest of the month, you know, we've got we've got the, the reserves in the bank, if you like, to, to be remote. 
Um, so is it a particular point in a project? Is it a particular training and development activity? You know, but where we really make use of that office space and people together so that we're not just saying, you know, oh, you have to be in the office between nine and five on these days because, you know, well, why? why? What's different to me being in the office versus being remote? Um, so definitely the flexibility and, um, you know, the focus on the outputs and not just time. And I think there's something around the transparency as well as, um, you know, going back to the communication point and the importance of, you know, leaders, managers, whoever sort of being very open in their communication, that sort of transparency. And as you say, seeing, you know, whether it's the dog or the children or whoever on, on the, um, the VC screen, um, you know, there's a certain transparency that sort of come from people sharing, you know, more about their, their sort of lives and the privilege that we can sort of see from that when we're on calls with people. Um, but what does that look like in your your sort of like your business processes as well, you know, and, and you know, sharing reports and progress. Um, and I think that's very important to keep as well. I guess you're doing poll surveys and that sort of thing with your with your employees to understand these sort of numbers, because I think there's different numbers coming out in terms of what, is it going to be 70, 30? Is it going to be, you know, what, what percentage do people want to come back in the office? And then, um, and obviously, depending on your business, it may not be about the office. It may be, you know, externals or remote sites and whatever. But equally, then you've got, I guess we're coming into this, this whole kind of argument about um, the workplace, the office space you actually have. I mean, there's all these kind of interesting sort of dynamics going on, isn't there? And it's interesting, we're an international business as well, right? So the chances of, you know, you having everybody in one office, even before COVID, right, was very rare. So, you know, again, it's not so much of a change. We had to have the sort of the working practices that, you know, we can connect globally anyway. So so they're already sort of existing. Yeah. And I need to add on that, Berta. Sorry, I was just trying, I suppose I was just trying to think in a bit aloud away from managing change, although it is a change in sense, isn't it? But. Yes, I totally agree with Justine. I think people forget how much they have been working virtually before, um, mm. but they were all doing it in the office. And what people are now saying is why, if I'm working virtually anyway, because we're a global organization, do I have to be 100% in the office itself? And I think the other point is with all the technology which we have available, there's really no need, you know, and you can think about broader talent pools um, because you're not looking for talent pools anymore who are within hours or 90 minute commute, you know, whatever is tolerable for the day. You can think about actually if you have the best software developer sitting in that the outer Hebrides, well, why not? you know, because you can connect in. And um, I think those are really the thoughts for the future. And you're absolutely right in terms of survey. So we're doing quite a bit. We are doing an annual uh, staff survey. We're doing quarterly surveys to really check in. Do people talk to each other and how do they talk to each other? We also did a dedicated work from home uh, survey. And of course, there are outliers, you know, some people who go, I'll work from home now all the time. And then there are others who go, I'll never work from home if I can help it. But the majority really is in the middle, nearly 80 percent who just want to have that flexibility and who want to be able to come together, then move away again. And it's down um, to personality really you know if i'm an introvert i probably can't think of anything better than to shut myself away and those are the same people whom you find in offices thinking sitting in think tanks they are the ones who get the corner open plan seat um and then you have the extroverts you know who have conversations across different uh, desks and um, who just thrive on the energy around them. And I think that those are also the aspects which we need to take into consideration for the future. So it's not just about can the role be done um, in certain places. It's actually how do you make sure you get a really good mixture of personality profiles as well. So you keep the innovation going, you get the different perspectives, 
and um, you are able to move forward rather than just becoming entrenched in one way of thinking. I think trying to, I was talking to someone the other day and it was about, uh, you know, managing a, a sort of a fairly large team, but worried about they're losing that kind of team environment and that kind of network of they're working on new development kind of work. So I guess there's that challenge, isn't it? I mean, it is just a different way of, of working, but like trying to retain and get the best from it is, is going to be the, the, the difficult part for some managers, I think, to get, get past. But I think that's exactly it about what are the skills you need to manage in a virtual environment? And yeah. I think our um, insights show that even when people have been sitting together, that doesn't necessarily make for a good culture. You know, the hallmarks of a good culture are very manifold. <laughs> and it's not just being together. And you know, that is something to consider. But nicely, that brings us to our next question, which is um, all around the skills. So what skills do you feel managers and leaders uh, need to have to work successfully in this more flexible um, and potentially more virtual environment? So, again, probably, Berto, do you want to have a stab at that first? And... Yeah, I don't think there is anything new or magic. You know, if I had to sum it up in two words, it would be EQ and growth mindset. And uh, we have been talking about this <clears throat> for a long time. And what I mean by that is, is number one, people really need to understand themselves and how they manage themselves and their own resilience, you know, the um, authenticity. And I think that's what the crisis has shown. All of a sudden, you can't divide yourself between the home person and the office person anymore because you will have the dog, the cat, um, the children, or just the private environment, which gives a much broader reflection about um, how this person is. And I think the key thing as part of that is as well, having the humility not to say, I know everything. So the second point is really the consistency of interacting with other people. And um, I, I tend to call it really a listening culture. You know, we still have a lot of people who listen to speak that you can see them sitting on the edge, you know, even in Zoom meetings, because they have this brilliant insight they need to share rather than listen to understand where you show the empathy and, and really hearing without judgment what's going on. Then I think another point which we found uh, critical is the psychological safety. And that's actually all about people being able to own up to their own mistakes, feeling free to speak up, feeling that there is no coming back if they are saying something and they feel something gets done as well. And then finally, I think there's a big, a huge point on inclusion. And certainly a lot of people have fed back to me that they found, um, even though it's tiring looking at Zoom <laughs> all day, every day, but they have felt much more included rather than when you have uh, people sitting around a table and then maybe some people are being brought in from a different office via video link and so forth. So it has leveled the playing field. I think I've heard that a number of times on, on you're absolutely right, people being brought into virtual meetings from anywhere. And, and it's not all about hierarchy then. It will, it will be, you want the right people in the right, you know, at that meeting to get what you need done. And I, I, I really like that. I think that's really positive. Justine, what about you? What are you, what are you thinking? Definitely empathy. Um, I think sort of staying true and, you know, just being human, you know, just being, um, you know, yourself, um, the flexibility piece, definitely, you know, that the trust, um, you know, and I think, you know, staying connected to people, um, but really sort of, I think we have to make a conscious effort to go outside of that immediate network of people that you would just necessarily work with on you know whatever that task or whatever that project is um, but you know looking at you know or who am I not naturally connected with for this piece of work and you know who haven't I spoken to for you know whatever the the, the, the longest 
um, period of appropriate time is and being conscious to go out and connect with those people, not because you need it for work task, but, you know, just to sort of like check in with people that, you know, you are genuinely interested in how they're doing. Um, and, and as Berta says, you know, properly listening, you know, properly sort of like tuning in again, not just because you need some piece of information from that person, but, um, you know, being authentic about, you know, are you okay? And, you know, what's going on in your world and, you know, understanding their perspective. So uh, agree, definitely uh, the, the EQ side. Yeah, and I think I've, I've said this a lot in these interviews. It's all about it's been all about the unknown. And, and you're right. Have that humility to stand up and say, I don't know the answers. Leaders aren't used to that. They, they're used to, and, and people are looking up going, I want to know these answers. You should know them. It, it's been an interest. So you're right. It's a leveler to some degree in, in terms of that. Um, OK. Um, so and can I just touch on one other thing then and, and probably both of you really, but we, we talked at the, at the start about trusting people right to do their jobs and it's very project based perhaps so there's this whole piece about performance management as well so how are you because obviously that's quite exciting because we never i think felt like it's been a struggle for so many years to get performance management right now we're on a virtual kind of how are you tackling that and what opportunities do you see there we have been pushing it for a few years actually to say it's very much about the continuous conversations and the golden rule to start out with is you need to articulate what you expect of people and that is not a list of glorified objectives because if you remember especially in the banking sector a lot of people not only met their objectives but they're overachieved but they didn't deliver on their job. And that's why we had a lot of the problems which we have had. And so uh, what we're saying is you need to be absolutely clear what your role is about, you know, what you need to deliver, and then even, well, as important, how you do that, whether it's the policies or the frameworks or the values, you know, which uh, Justine mentioned very early on in the conversation and how to navigate this crisis it is actually having your North Star and, and a moral compass, you know, where you want to get to. And that has been the foundation um, for us. And then building on that, uh, we have taken away single ratings some time ago because they had a counter effect on how people actually dealt with contribution because it became a bargaining approach you know sort of we called it hand-to-hand -hand combat you know it was all about what is that final uh, grade i get written down and um so it's really about the interaction and the collaboration and achieving together for deutsche bank uh, which is the ethos of, of our performance approach and then in the end it's about accountability but what we have noticed, so those are the, the setups which we have in place already. Um, and what has been interesting throughout the crisis, certainly the amount of team meetings, has got, helpful team meetings has gone up as our people reported. But what people found harder was how you do uh, feedback when you don't see people. So obviously, a lot of people shy away from that anyway it's difficult and you know uncomfortable so that has taken a bit of a back seat but i think the other reason why it's taken a back seat is that during the crisis people were so focused on pure survival quote unquote you know organizational survival will um the company still deliver will will i be able to deliver will i be able to juggle you know, between homeschooling and actually delivering my job. So I would expect it as we settle in and kids go back to school and the this situation becomes the new normal for that to pick up again. But yes, it's a different world, but I don't think it has to do much with COVID itself. I think is um, about how people want to be managed differently you know, how they want to be now in this um, fourth industrial revolution of skills exchange rather than the traditional hierarchies, you know, where my manager will tell me what to do and I will do exactly that. 
so I don't know, Justine, um, we've had loads of conversations on this. I was just thinking that, I mean, some of, from a framework perspective, you know, with Berta's help, some of the, so we have a, a rhythm, which is um, aligned to our project, which is sort of 10 weekly sprints. Um, so we have two weekly commitments. So, so to, Ber to Berta's point around everyday conversations, these are just, again, not because of COVID, but this was the rhythm that we sort of set up. So they're just natural kind of like every day, every week, sort of like progress conversations. Um, and we work to commitments and, you know, we have retros on those retrospectives all the time. Um, you know, there's a peer feedback mechanism, again, sort of focused around the three values. Um, we, we made sure that, and we did this remotely, we had a, a sort of coaching upskilling session for everybody so that, you know, that, that peer feedback, um, you know, is meaningful and, um, you know, can be well given and well received. Um, but it is very much sort of like bringing that rhythm to the everyday and not making it, you know, at just this point in time, then we talk about how you're doing and, you know, it's a big surprise. Yeah, and, and you, I guess I'm just thinking also about um, just probably taking it back a stage, but, but more about the technology. I guess technology is a great enabler in terms of this performance management measurement. I mean, is, is that, are you, I, I guess, perhaps, Justin, you're looking at ways of, you know, are you looking at ways of sort of this continual measurement? Um, because if that trust part is the bit that is the bit that tr trying to let go of, how, how do you sort of, how, how are you able to measure it? Measure that kind of thing. Yeah. It's technology and, and whether that's, um, you know, in a, a people system or in a commitments, um, you know, work board. But there is also the transparency piece there as well, you know, that anybody can sort of see this, um, you know, so there, there's the right um, sort of like discipline and style to, you know, whether that's feedback or, you know, progress on commitments. But it's also, you know, that, you know, if something doesn't work out how, you know, it's originally intended that there's a learning from that as well in, in the retrospective and there's a purpose to look back at that. And, and you know, whether that's, you know, pivoting to something different or, you know, just killing something, um, there's definite value in sort of looking backwards at, at, you know, things that haven't gone quite the way that we thought they would. And there's all seems to be this sort of um, a real, um, I, I was seeing it, a moral compass, especially with our, you know, uh, people want to kind of see a purpose, don't they, for the, the business as well, which I think is really strong. That's coming through loud and clear. Are, are you seeing that at, at both your kind of organisations, really? Yes. Yeah. No, people want to have a purpose. You know, they want to know why they're coming to work, what they're doing. Yeah. And um, we have been working a lot on that at Deutsche Bank, being very mindful from where we've come from. So yeah. our focus is really on creating positive impact, whether it is about um, our clients, whether it is our external stakeholders, our employees. How can I do the best every day and really focus on that? And it's about keeping the bank sustainable. And um, so while it might not sound sort of um, that forward looking, I think it has been very refreshing for people to say, actually, that's why I come here. You know, what I can do will have a positive impact, be it on financing someone's livelihood, be it about um, getting innovation going in a different industry. I mean, in Germany especially, we have been uh, very much involved with the mid-sized market, uh, keeping those companies alive and really working in true partnership and uh, being very much part of the solution. And I think our clients have been uh, very appreciative of that approach, you know, putting everything to sight and say, this is the human aspect. So the message which uh, Justine mentioned early on in the um, in our conversation was absolutely aligned. You know, it was all about the human aspect, both for our employees and staying safe and making sure that we looked after each other, be it from a physical or, or mental well-being, but also looking after our clients, you know, and being very mindful that uh, many, many of them going through a very tough time 
and how can we be there to um, support them through this tough time. And I think that actually then takes performance to a very different level because in the past you would have performance as a judgment, you know, at the year end. And yes, there's of course accountability and of course we need to contribute and so forth. But now performance becomes a partnership approach because we all want to do the best thing for the bank, uh, for the environment, um, for clients and, and for our own employees. Yeah, and that, and that, isn't that lovely? <laughs> isn't that lovely? Just, just anything to add on that one? No, just, just, um, just a, a reflection that you know that partnership um, in performance is very additive for people's CVs, right? It's not just for the business, you know, but it, it's, you know, it's your own sort of personal value, um, you know, and it's your own development as well, and and that's very fulfilling from from your own sort of like human uh human being perspective you know all right so let's move on to finally you know, i always like this one because it's all about it's all very personal now isn't it so it's kind of like you know these incredible times so what's it like for you both going through these times um truly disruptive moment uh, in our working history so what's it like being a senior hr leader for you personally and and, and equally professionally so bertha yes I think I've been thinking a lot about this question. Um, it's been certainly very, very busy uh, because all of a sudden people are interested in what's the behavior, you know, will people be able to be productive? How do we manage actually in this environment? What do our employees think? You know, how is this landing? Are we doing the right style, et cetera, et cetera. And it has been um, just as exhilarating, you know, to, to find that our managers, I mean, we've got plenty of managers who have always been brilliant, but also the ones who were maybe unsure of their managing capability have really risen um, to the challenge, uh, to the point that nearly 90% of our people say it's fantastic of how we have been managed the flexibility we've had and um, the trust. And that is sort of the culmination really of a lot of work which um, my team and many colleagues in the HR department have been doing over years. You know, people having this realization that when you put people at the center of your attention, if you show this empathy and understanding and flexibility, but by the same token, people focused on what we need to deliver they feel motivated and they feel very engaged and um, certainly that's where we are and um, I have to say that has been a real moment of pride uh, personal pride uh, for me to see this aha moment with a lot of people and now of course I mean it's been hard don't get me wrong you know it's not been easy all of a sudden stepping out into this different environment but um, now the focus for us is to keep this going, support our managers, support our general staff and uh, people to say, you can continue with this, you know, and when you come together, it will feel great actually to um, continue with all these behaviors which you have learned. So from a professional point of view, it has been, um, yeah, you know, it has been very inspirational and exhilarating in the same, same measure, really. And personally, I can't complain being in sunny uh, Wiltshire and, you know, so it has been all right for me. But my heart does go out to a lot of people who've had a very, very tough time, especially when you have to do caring for um, perhaps parents or people who do need looking after the homeschooling you know that has been really tough and our um mental health first aiders uh, have been very busy in giving that support network yeah, no uh, you put that quite yeah, absolutely it's been, been everyone's been affected in such an incredibly different way haven't they justine how about you how about you personally and uh, for the organization yeah it's um it, it's definitely an inflection point right it's um 
you know, again, sort of reflecting on the stuff that we put into place from a, a culture, um, a behaviours, a values, um, and, and all the articulation of that. I guess the reflection was, um, you know, again, sort of personal pride, actually, that we took a lot of time to design those very deliberately. Um, and they seem to be the right things. Um, so from that perspective, you know, I, I feel sort of very proud of that, you know, whether it's, the, you know, the structures, the values, you know, even down to the healthcare provider that we chose, right? We chose the supplier because it was very much around prevention as well as cure. So some of the, the you know, the wellbeing and, and the mental health offers um, have been very strong. Um, and I guess my my sort of personal reflection again, I've I've been very lucky um, throughout personally throughout the the whole um, sort of time, but um, I'm very conscious that, that you know I'm hearing so much about loneliness, um, and so I'm sort of just um, toying with personally what can I um, what can I do to help people in those sort of situations, whether that's from a you know a sort of like local organisation um you know how can i sort of personally offer some sort of support um to, to those people organizations whatever yeah no i think that's 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 really yeah quite poignant isn't it i think i think we all said all along that it's um personally i've got lots of different responses when i when i ask them because obviously some people have have had huge workforces and had to you know as a hrd they have to kind of really look after them and they've had all different raft of different things from from you know something very serious to, to to you know just like you said that remote working and people on top of each other and you know and schooling it, it's it's a massive combination of things so okay all right that's terrific i think that's um it's it's, it's been an interesting one because it's gonna be a really good flavor in a different way isn't it in terms of but i love the fact that you've obviously been doing some behavioral uh, a lot of behavioral work there you know Berta, and, and just need to see what how the bank's kind of looking at this and how you're kind of looking to the future and and that speed and agility which is vital isn't it at the moment and how that might continue so um so let me just sum up um and and thank you for your time today uh, and we'll obviously have another uh, senior hr leader interviews coming up soon uh, and we'll look at these opportunities again for this new better that we're all looking for so thank you you two thank you thank you, thank you.